Ja, hallo und herzlich willkommen. Mein Name ist Daniel Unsold. Ich bin der Moderator des heutigen Abends. Ich bin selber Moderator und Theaterpädagoge und werde euch heute und morgen durch die Abenddiskussion leiten. Okay, ich bin aber nicht da, um die Begrüßung zu machen, sondern ich wollte mich nur kurz vorstellen und jemand anderes vorstellen, und zwar Dr. Til Stellmacher vom uh, Live hier, Center for Development Research, Right Livelihood College, der die offizielle Begrüßung der Veranstaltung übernimmt. Bitte schön. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. May we switch into English, please, as many of us are uh, non-German uh, native speakers. Um, this event has been organized as part of, of an international conference currently happening here in Bonn. The conference is called The Next Generation of Sustainability. And the conference and this event here has been organized basically by three organizations. One is the Right Livelihood uh, College, located at the Center for Development Research, CEF, at the University of Bonn, here uh, in Bonn. The other is the Youth Future Project, and the Youth Future Project is a non-profit organization and open network. And the Youth Future Project, this is a special issue, uh, is funded and managed fully voluntarily by students and young people. So there is no big organization behind that. Last but not least, we are also uh, uh, working together with the city of Bonn. So you see many other partners here and we are particularly grateful to the financial support of the German Academic Exchange Service, of the Deutsche Bundesstiftung Umwelt and of the Stiftung Internationale Begegnungen der Sparkasse Bonn. Having said this, I wish you a very interesting evening here with distinguished experts and so I will give the word to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Til Stellmacher. So, our topic today is the Green New Deal and post-growth directions for future economies. But before we really get into detail into that, I want to introduce you that we're not just going to have a panel discussion and you just listen all the time, but I want you to be involved in the evening today. And you can be involved in several ways. So maybe you are wondering why you have some cards on your seat. So look under your bum. What do you find there? Okay, you see different cards. There should be a green one. Can you show me the green one? Very good. What is green normally indicating? Yes, very good. So you have the red one. I don't get into detail what red means, but you have a white card. What is a white card an invitation for? To write something on it? Very good. This is for your questions. So, while we start, like with introductory statements here on the stage, you can think of, ah, oh, come on, they're talking really boring things. I want to know this from this person. Oh, I want to know that. Or this is interesting to discuss. So write it down. But the point is you write it down in a nicely readable way and preferably just one question. You can use both sides if you want, but don't make like scribble, 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 like 20 questions. We can't use that and it's also hard for our two, please get up, ambassadors. These are the ambassadors of the audience. Alessa Rode and Svenja Kvic. Alessa, Svenja, thank you very much. So, they are coming after about 20 minutes in the middle corridor to collect the cards. I'm going to announce this. So, you will pass on your cards to the center so they can easily get them. And then they're going to look through and see like what questions have been put the most or which is the most interesting question. And these are the ones they're going to put forward on behalf of all of you. Okay, good. So now we want to try and just any questions on this procedure? No, it's clear, good. So I want to see first, now who's coming from Germany who's in the audience? Use your card now. Ah, okay. So it's about, looks like a third. So who comes from the greater area of Europe? 
Europe, the Germans are not part of it. <laughs> obviously, obviously. So, who's from further away? The rest of the world. All right. Oh, I would have thought there would be more people from further away. Okay, thank you very much. Good to know. So, who of you is studying? That was kind of expectable. There's a lot of students. But who's still going to school? Wow. Yeah. Wow, great. And who's working hard already? Could also be students, though. <laughs> I don't think so. Okay. So then, generally, just see like who is between 20 and 40. So uh, we got all that going. Who is that with the red cards? What do you want to imply by being 20 and 40, but with a red card? And 20, 40, but not. You have birthday now. <laughs> Something like that. Okay. Who is older than 40? I think we, yeah, here in the front. You didn't get any cards? No? This is terrible. You should be involved. Okay, so, okay, so we can get going with this. Very good. So, and who is younger than 20? Wow. This is like, this is really good. You're on the right place here. Okay, so we had one question that was interesting to the organizers. Who of you is already engaged in civil society? Hmm. So, this is the right livelihood college. Wow, there is a big share of people being engaged. It's something where you don't earn money. <laughs> well, the cards are going down. No? Okay, good. So, who of you knew the alternative Nobel Prize before this event took place? Also question. It's not so many. I would say this is a third who knew it. Okay, very good. So, um, well, these are the most important questions we want to find out now. So now you know how we use these cards. So I want to now start presenting to you who will be here on our stage today. So we have a winner of the German Environmental Award and one of the fastest speakers in Germany. He was actually contesting against uh, a famous rapper in Germany, and he's faster. <laughs> but that's not mainly because why he's here today. He's also head of the House of the Future, where various associations, non-profit organizations work together. And he is, and that's what he's mo mostly famous for, he's the inventor of the environmental management assessment system, which is for many companies how to get greener. He was one of the first people to really implement it in his company and also to write a book upon it. So let's give a big hand for Dr. Winter. Please come up on stage. You can already come here. So you get the left seat. Thank you very much. So this is number one. I'm really keen to hear you talking. The next one is a woman on our stage, and she's the head of the research group Sustainable Life Quality at the Sustainable Europe Research Institute, the SERI. So, now I want to see a card, green card or red card. Who knows the SERI, the Sustainable Europe Research Institute? Okay, it's also some red cards. Does it mean no or does it mean you know it? We just say the green ones for who knows it now? Okay, good. And she has 15 years of sustainability research. She also has been working together already with one of our other members here on the board today, a long time ago, but this is a secret still. And um, like her projects are mainly focused on what is like sustainability and a good life. How can we get it together? So please give a hand to Dr. Ines Oman. Welcome. <laughs> Our third guest on the podium is somebody who's really into new concepts. He's been working on something like post-growth or degrowth. So now we try the red cards and green cards used simultaneously. Who knows what degrowth is? Red card, no. Green card, yes. Mm, some cards stay down, undecided. Okay, it's about half-half. 
It's very good. We are going to do some explaining around this, so also the people who don't know yet about these concepts can find out. Here, our guest is a member of several networks who are like kind of pushing forward the discussion for new concepts for growth. And one of them is uh, the Network for Pluralism in Economics. And he's also actually a PhD student. And your topic is the consequences of an economy without growth for the social welfare. It's a very important topic. Give a hand to Dr. Christoph Gran. To Christoph Gran. <laughs> Doctor to be. Doctor to be. <laughs> so, <laughs> very welcome. Now, yeah, it's always the last one who is the most famous. So now I'm, I've got the honor to present to you another winner of the German Environmental Award of the DBU. He is uh, co-chair of the International Resource Panel of the UNEP, the United Nations Environmental Programme. He's co-president of the Club of Rome, honorary member of the World Future Council, and as you maybe might have read it, one of his most recent and famous book, Factor 5, suggests that we can learn to become five times more efficient, five times, in the use of energy and material resources. I could tell a lot more about Professor Dr. Ernst Ulrich von Weizsäcker. I sit here, okay. that's okay. Good. So now we've got this very interesting and illuminated group on the podium. And we want to start the discussion with four questions. So everybody has a bit of time to feel accommodated here on stage, but also to explain a bit what they're doing, what is the main points of their work. And we hope that these four questions in the beginning give also a nice overview of our topic today green growth, degrowth, what is the right way. So, my first question goes to you, Mr. Weizsäcker. It's like one of the most important questions we all face is how much time do we still have in this current economic system before our high level of prosperity that makes all this sitting in shiny rooms with light, everybody traveling here, possible? How much time actually do we have to change our current path? We have no time to lose. If we continue like this, collapses will come 30 years from now, at the latest. To transform the world's economies and societies to sustainable path, I suggest it will take 100 years. So that's your kind of, frankly, a hundred years we need in this time. But, like, you've been working on many ways, so how do you think, like, what path do we need to take so we don't end up in a collapse? Do you see signs of it today? I see very little signs. Bhutan tried it, and the government trying was kicked out by the electorate a couple of, week, uh, couple of months ago. Ecuador made a brave attempt at saving the underground oil and reverted this policy a fortnight ago. Germany had a relatively powerful sustainability council, but the current election campaign does not even contain the words environment or sustainability. So we see backward trends dominating. So you actually seems like there's very little signs of hope. Is that true? No. <laughs> but I'm just trying to be honest. <laughs> Seriously. And I do have a, lo a lot of hope, but the kind of concepts that I'm proposing, and my friends do, are not exactly popular. The popular voice doesn't seem to like what is needed to protect the environment. They like consumption, as simple as that. 
They love it. Okay, we'll use that for a basic check. Who of you loves consumption? <laughs> oh, this is <laughs> cards up, cards up. <laughs> so you have to decide yes or no. Yeah, oh. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. You see, many people are ashamed of the question, obviously. Hmm. It's a very good point. So even here in this audience, we've got the focal point, consumption. No questions yet, you can write it down. That's the concept. I'm sorry. Okay, so when you say signs of hope, hmm, you have some signs of hope, but you think it's all basically that we are still stuck in our consumption patterns. What could break them up? Enlightenment, understanding reality. Let me give you an example. You can calculate the number of kilowatt hours required to lift a 10 kilograms weight, say a bucket of water, from sea level to the top of Mount Everest. And if I'm asking people, intellectuals like you, the typical answer I tend to get is anything between 100 and 1,000 kilowatt hours. The answer of the physics teacher is one quarter of a kilowatt hour, meaning that our perception of what a kilowatt hour can do is wrong by a factor at least of 400. Okay? Meaning that the postulate of a five-fold increase of resource productivity is an extremely modest one. So there is much more possible than we think Absolutely. is possible. There is, I mean, this, the sky is the limit to improving efficiency. But all policies on Earth are destroying the potentials for efficiency gains. Can you show us some examples where, like, for you, the most crucial, like, this potential is destroyed? Well, let me begin with the instruments that I mean when saying uh, politics tend to destroy efficiency. In the latest World Energy Report, published a month ago or so, you can read that during the last two years, the amount of public money subsidies for more energy consumption has risen by $300 billion. Yeah? That's quite an incentive. Yeah. Countries want people to consume more energy and give public money for doing that. Do you see any opposite policies? I mean, when I was member of parliament, we did the opposite in a tiny way by introducing the ecological tax reform, increasing fuel and electricity prices a bit by six pfennig at the time per liter. It's about three per cents per liter. Per year, which is really a modest kind of thing. And using all that money essentially, essentially to reduce indirect labor cost, so it would become more profitable for people to lay off kilowatt hours and uh, barrels of petrol and hire people instead of laying off people and hiring kilowatt hours. So it was extremely clever to do it, and it saved or created roughly a quarter million jobs in Germany. But it was, of course, abandoned because it was unpopular. Yeah, I still the remember. The Bildzeitung <laughs> hated it and campaigned against it no end. Yeah, everybody was alive at the time remembers this like big picture in the most prominent yellow sheet press of Germany. It's like five marks the liter. This is where they want to go. They're crazy. Mm. So nobody dared to touch that subject anymore, even though most scientists said it's logic. I remember. Well, that's yeah, kind of a strong example. But I mean, now I think we really got the urgency from what you were saying, but. 
maybe before we continue with the next, like, where is the path to efficiency? Where does it start? I repeat myself, enlightenment. Know what is possible. Nobody, even in this educated audience, knows, really. I mean, Georg Winter just said to me that he is building a multifamily house under the passive house um, conditions, which means, essentially, to reduce heating needs from 100 to something like 5, depending on the specification. That's fantastic, but that's the exception, isn't it? So, this is one example. Yeah. You could look into transport, you could look into industry, you could look into agriculture, wherever you care to look. A five-fold increase of resource productivity is available now. And in the long term, it could be a factor of 20. All right. So all we need is enlightenment. I want to go on to Dr. Ines Oman and ask, like, so if it's just enlightenment, what we need seems like a good life is still possible, even under different conditions. Do you think so? <laughs> well, first of all, I want to say good evening to all of you, and thanks for inviting me. It's really great to be here beside these wonderful other people at the, at the podium. And to your question, I don't think that Ernst Ulrich meant that it's only enlightenment we need. This was sure a starting not. point, a yeah. leverage point, which I agree with. Um, and what is important for me concerning change, a change we need starting now in order to be able to have sustainability, maybe only in 100 years, hopefully earlier, is a, a kind of a holistic perception of this change. And I like to see it from maybe four different angles, saying we need a change from the inside, from the outside, within us as individuals, but also within us as a group or a collective. And the idea of having efficiency much stronger in our way we work and we live would be like this outer dimension of a change, which is very important. Um, and I have worked a lot in the last years on this inner change we need all of us, or which I would say is already maybe starting to be a bit more positive or optimistic than you are. Um, and what does it mean to change in the inner? This means, first of all, to be somehow clear or aware that the life we live now, although it seems to be good, doesn't do any good for in the long run. It might be good for us now, but not for our kids, and maybe not even for us uh, in a couple of years. And I do think that there is already a group of people in the rich countries who feel that somehow the life they're living is not doing good. They might not be able to express this, to express this. they might not be able to, to stand to it, and they might not know how to change things, but they feel something is not, not doing good to them or is not going well. And I think this potential should... this not going anymore, the mic? This potential shall be used uh, by our educational system, for example. Okay. Um, oh no. And um, yeah, to, to work with people who are already open for this change. And I mean by change, a change of values, of belief systems. A belief system might be uh, if I consume, I feel good. Or if I. Uh, fulfill my need uh, for participating in a certain group by having a certain car or a certain outfit, uh, then I have a belief system. But I can change this and say, OK, I want to be part of this special group. And maybe I don't need outer things or material things for this, but maybe um, we do some traveling together by going on mountains and, and having fun there. This is just an easy example. Um, but to, to, f yeah, to be aware that I can meet my needs with different strategies or lifestyles. And here the efficiency comes into being. Because on the one hand, the individual is responsible for his or her life and lifestyle, but you cannot put all the responsibility for being sustainable on, on, on individuals and consumers, as we like to call them. Although human is much more than a consumer, I would say. 
Uh, we also have to put this responsibility on the economy, economic system, on the business and on the politicians, but not always saying, I'm not responsible, the other one has to start, and not starting therefore. This is a hand-egg problem. Everybody should start, everybody is able to start, be it me as a person, me as a business person, or me as an, uh, a political person. Um, well, I think I've already talked a lot, but this <laughs> is uh, what I wanted to add to what, what uh, Jens yeah, said. Yeah, it's like yeah. really the personal dimension. I yeah. think we are continuing on that path, but I mean, now we've been seeing it's the urgency that we need to act and how little is actually happening or that all the paths we are going are mostly also in the opposite direction. And there's a potential each of one has, but another question could be, is there not really a need for another like different general concept? like a whole totally new way we think of our society, of our economy. This is something I want to ask you. It's like, what concepts are there of a different way we could do actually life and business? Thank you for the question and thanks a lot for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here with all of you. And I was asked to introduce these two concepts of uh, Green New Deal and degrowth or aftergrowth. In German it's Postwachstum. And uh, yes, um, let me start with the Green New Deal. The Green New Deal is the idea to reuse this uh, approach uh, Roosevelt chose in the 30s. It was a new deal, it was after the big crisis that a state should start investing in society and um, create new jobs, create new infrastructure. And the Green New Deal now is the idea to create green technologies, green infrastructure, green jobs, and to use the money the state is spending to get a green economy. You have, at the same time, secondary approaches, like uh, a regulation of the financial markets, for example. You have a redistribution of income. Um, what else? We have different ecological tax reforms, I would say, in order to, to bring the economy onto the green track. This is the idea behind it. Um, I think these are good measurements. It's a good idea behind it. But we shouldn't stop there. Um, and also develop other concepts. We shouldn't stop here because the Green New Deal is not overcoming this idea of consumption, this idea of growth this idea of faster and more and, and so on, and um, it overemphasizes technological solutions. One short sentence, you already said, also the Green New Deal is not really done in a, <laughs> in a nice way, so <laughs> maybe also the Green New Deal is an outsider position, and what I'm going to present now is the, the post-growth idea is even more outside. But still, I think it's, it's a good idea to think of. Um, it's not about the blueprint, it's not about some guy or some woman coming and telling us, okay, this is the way we have to go, this is the direction. It's more a slogan, as Serge Latouche puts it in France. It's an it's idea, it's a concept. Maybe some people call it also our growth or not believing in growth. It's to leave this, uh, this path. Um, We need, the idea behind this, behind it is that we need to change a lot of things in our life, in society. As we said, on the individual level, but also on a societal level. We have to change the way we live, we work, we produce, we consume, the way gen we use energy and resources and so on. Um, there's Tim Jackson with his book, uh, Prosperity Without Growth. Maybe this is a good way to describe what I'm talking about. We have to get rid of this fantasy, of this idea that we need to grow in order to have a decent life, in order to have jobs, in order to have anything. If I ask you, maybe you can tell me five things why we need growth. Maybe we should get rid of this and rather look at the goals we're looking at, the goals we want to reach, and then ask, okay, what could be a good way to come there? Rather than saying we need growth, and by the way, growth is helping us in everything. Um, let me give you six differences to the Green New Deal. Do I still have some minutes? Green New Deal versus post-growth, after-growth. Six reasons why I think post-growth is a very interesting alternative to think about it. First of all, it's the ecolog ecological crisis. If we talk about green growth, 
we always have in mind that with technological solutions, we can decouple our ecological impact from GDP. But it's not being observed. It's not at all being observed. The other way, <laughs> our eco ecological impact is still rising globally, and therefore it's, it's a myth that we can decouple these two. So if you go the next step, if you think about, okay, we can't decouple it, but our ecological footprint should go down. There's only one way. GDP should at least be stable, maybe even go down. Maybe it's, this is the first point. And the second point, even if it goes down and stays stable, so what? Why are we afraid of it? GDP and well-being is not connected anymore. It was connected in the 50s, 60s, maybe in the 70s, but research shows it's not connected anymore. GDP, a rising GDP is, does not mean that you're more happy or more and, and living in a good society. It's missing the ecological costs. It's missing the disparity of income. It's missing the reproductive services women do. It's missing so many things to GDP and doesn't give us any direction. It's misleading. It's not answering the question, what is a good life? What is a decent life? Therefore, we, we need new indicators. The third point is global justice. I think the, the Green New Deal suggests that we can consume the way we do, even a little bit more, but as we do it more efficient, it's not a problem, so let's go on like we live at the moment. It's not a, okay the way we live. We should consume way less. We are on such a high level here in Europe, in Germany. We have, let's say, 11 tons CO2. We consume, if we should go down to four tons, how can we do it with more efficient things putting on the top? So we have to talk about consuming less. I think it's inevitable, but as Ernst Ulrich von Heizsäcker said already, it's not very popular to talk about it. Or to raise the hand on it, it was also not very popular. <laughs> Sorry? To raise the hand on it was the question where we got the least hands yeah, up. Yeah, it's, it's, like consumption. Nah, it's oh, everybody no, knows no. something's wrong, but we, we don't talk about it. No. Okay, two more points. One is uh, peak everything. One of the great drivers of economic growth was cheap oil and cheap resources. Cheap oil and cheap resources are running out. The oil price goes like this. It goes up and up and up and up. And I think the times of... Uh, Infinite if I may interrupt growth. here, yeah. I want to introduce some points. If the speakers talk too long, this is the first sign mm -hmm. saying you got 30 seconds to go. Mm -hmm. This is like the sign, finish your sentence. Okay, uh, yeah. so now you get this sign. 30 seconds. Yeah. Okay, the last point is we don't have any growth anymore anyway. We live in high saturated economies with growth rates very close to zero, but all our society is dependent on growth. And I'm very interested in living in a society which can go on and work and is not going into deeper troubles every day. So, the main point is, we already live in a post-growth society and we, need, we urgently need economic concepts to deal with this. Finito. Thank you very much. So, I, I let him talk a bit longer so we get a general idea what the topic is about we had in the headline. Now, I want to remind you that you have the white cards if you didn't write anything on it, you should do it now in the next five minutes because then we're going to start to collect the cards. So, get into yourself, think for a moment. And here on stage, we're nevertheless going to continue and use that time. Dr. Georg Winter, we've been just listening to some concepts here on the stage. Green New Deal, yes, degrowth, yes. post-growth. The yes, question there is like are several model, models <laughs> for a post-growth society. Well, I, I, I haven't finished my question even. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How is that possible? <laughs> so I have to like now my authority on stage. So I'm working on this. So my question on you is like, are there really like these concepts? You have been working a lot really with business, so you're not just some university person who's been studying and things like, oh, I think that's right, I've been doing research on it. No, you really had a company and you tried to change it. Yeah. So when you look like based down on these concepts, do you think they can really be the solution and are they really like realistic? Can there be green growth and still like the world doesn't go to collapse? Is it possible? Yeah. Thank you uh, for the question. Uh, I think there are several models for a post-growth society. 
but we will never have a post-growth society without a post-growth citizen. And I will explain this to you. I want to play now a devilish game with you. I'm no more George Winter, I'm a devil now. Imagine you are a government representative, a member of parliament, a private businessman or a representative of the media. And also imagine you are determined to radically commercialize our society. Do you know what five strategic objectives I would recommend? My first strategic objective would be to detach the people from their emotional and intellectual roots. Destroy any spiritual bond with whatever gives people security, faith, heritage and family. Deny God and relativize the messages of the Bible. Make sure the churches limit themselves to a cotton cozy, aerodynamic, politically hypercorrect hyper messages, thus losing their credibility. Spoil people's love of their home and the beauty of their natural surroundings. Weaken all ties to tradition and discredit the family as an institution. That leads me to my second strategic objective. Deprive people of orientation. Take away their basic values, standards and critical capacity. Relativize the basis value of life, the value of creating life, preserving life, and developing life to its maximum value. Wherever life comes first, total commercialization is threatened. Make people insecure by overturning their standards for good and evil, true and false, beautiful and ugly, real and virtual, natural and synthetic. Simply don't allow people to measure advertising messages with idea of values handed down through generations. Critical capacity based on values is harmful to business. But what do we do with those who want to resist? That is addressed by my third strategic objective. Dispose of the backbone of the people's characters. Indoctrinate all children that their personal advantage in career must take precedence over conscience. Tell them being fair toward others is a luxury for losers. Deprive the children of even the slightest notion of standing up for their beliefs. Prepare your children for the fact that what the established forces of society are planning and doing is with all, without alternative. Make sure the kids have to learn so many mainstream idiocies that they no longer have the time to think for themselves. Your child should definitely do more pointless texting than mental flexing and outsource his or her brain activity to a computer. A fourth strategic objective is still missing. Dehumanize human beings to consumers. Suggest a right to enjoyment without responsibility. Hush up the connection between rights and duties. True joy and work, pleasure and achievement. Make sure they can no longer do anything but consume. Occupy the feelings and thoughts of people with advertising promises. Make them understand that only what they have and what they can afford are valuable. Do not give the consumers a moment's rest. Foster their thirst for variety, for ever new indulgences and places of amusement. Yes? Yellow card. That is exa exactly where my fifth strategic objective comes in. Make sure that commitment to economic growth is the first and last point in every politician's speech and in all political commentary. The face statement, the face statement must replace all, this face statement must replace all other religions. And now my last sentence, what shall we do how to become a post-growth citizen, we should do just the opposite what I said. And if you allow now, for a very short minute, a very <laughs> short poem. I'm sorry, like it's equality. You, you're, oh, okay, we make a voting. Who wants to 
hear the moral of this speech. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we go. Oh, yes. <laughs> a little <laughs> poem. Uh, I like poetry, I'm a poet. <laughs> Global player. This is, I, I speak to an international group. Hey, how are you today? You are a global player anyway. How is your global play? I want to ask, if I may, what are you playing for all the day? Who are you playing for all the day? Would you kindly say, by the way, what are you playing with all the day? Who are you playing with all the day? Huh. You play your global play, okay? But at the end of the day, who is going to pay? Wow, yeah. I didn't know this was coming. <laughs> <laughs> I have the feeling he has prepared this. Slightly. Okay, so now we want to, after this like, first round of like, longer sessions, now we want to get in a more flexible, communicative way of discussion. That means also now, please hand your white cards to the center. Hand your white cards to the center and our two Ambassadors, we work in the main aisle and collect the cards. So they have some time to choose which questions to put forward first. Okay, so we continue here. And now we have two theses we want to discuss. And we will also like ask your opinion from time to time what you think. And the first question we had is like, how do you, I will say like, evaluate the policies that are on the way now in relation to Green New Deal and post-growth. And as we are in Germany, I would like to start with Germany because here is election time, as many of you might maybe heard. In three weeks, we are voting for a new parliament. So the question would be first, like you've been talking about the concepts. So what do you see like when you see the work the government has done? Is any of the concepts going further to some success? No. No. <laughs> there was a no question, sorry. Yeah. Um, then it's a question like, I can if it's an if question, I would say, how do you evaluate them in that term? As he said already before, the word uh, environment is almost not being seen. And uh, I think for me, it's very frustrating, actually. I don't know if I'm completely wrong or if they are completely wrong. I sometimes feel very strange because I talk to people and they say, yes, you're right, it's a good idea you have, and let's talk about uh, another way of living. And when I see the political process, if I see the parties trying to be elected, I can't find myself there at all. This is, let me so say just, one more. Just one point. I want to say we had a lot of Germans here. Who can, of the people who are here, green card, if there is a party that represents you, red card, if there is no party that really represents you. So <laughs> it looks very much like the feeling you have yeah. is spread out. That's quite scary, actually. So let me give you an example where I very, very much feel represented. We were talking about belief systems. We were talking about how to change belief systems. And let me give you two examples where I think I can, I can see a good way of changing the belief system. One is the whole transition town movement or corporate, uh, corporate, oh my God, uh, community-based agriculture. If we have places, learning places, where we go and practice another way of living, another way of thinking, we have the possibility to change. If we just have enlightenment without a practical way of practicing what we are enlightened of, then this enlightenment which is even not there, <laughs> will perish somewhere. The other example is uh, what I do with our network for pluralism and economics. I think we have to lay the ground for a new way of thinking. As Mr. Winter said, everybody is being indoctrinated. When, if you go to university and study economics, or even something else, and you have to go to a course in economics, growth, growth, growth is what you learn. You will never ever talk about degrowth or steady state economy or anything like this, but we have to talk about it. You and I and all of us, if we want to construct or build up a new world, we have to get in new concepts into our minds. And therefore, economic 
or the bachelor and the master of economics needs to be changed urgently. Changed urgently. Thank you. All right. So, like my main problem, as I see now, being the facilitator, is that we're kind of all of the same opinion, which is <laughs> very good that somebody was shaking his head right now. So you're shaking your head now. So why do you shake your head, Mr. Weizsäcker? <laughs> well, look, the diagnosis is correct, but um, we have to go a little bit deeper. Why is politics and the media and public opinion so obsessed with growth? Huh. It's not just stupidity. It is because two values, which I'm sure also Christoph would not deny as being important, are in the current mindset very closely attached to growth. One is stable public finances and the other is jobs. So, if we decry what's happening in Portugal, in Greece, etc. No stable public finance, terrible situation, and we Germans have to bail them out all the time. Uh, and the Euro crisis is a tragedy. Everybody, I believe, in this room would agree. And then people say, well, what we have to do is now to engineer growth in Greece, in Portugal, in Italy. This is the solution. I have not seen in the press any other answer to the challenge. And secondly, on jobs, we know that growth statistics and job statistics go in the same direction. Now, I am not saying that this is a fate by the laws of nature. It's, in a sense, political stupidity. Failing to decouple employment from growth. Uh, responsible public finances from growth. But so far, I don't see any serious attempt at doing it. Probably because growth has become, I mean, this the devilish thing Georg Winter was uh, saying was, of course, a travesty of reality. Huh. In much of what we presently see in the press and in economic textbooks, etc., is very much like the devil. Oh. Oh. All right. So, yeah, you've put out like two main things: that obsession with growth and the nexus between jobs and growth that they're like not really never like separating in the way so I want to further the question to uh, Dr. Ines Oman and like thinking of how when you think like in like daily life decisions the people who are here could make what decisions can these people do to not replicate the same pattern that led to what Hans Ulrich von Weizsäcker just described wow it's not easy if you only do it from yourself and you're not supported by different conditions. I mean, what you can do and what is done and what I'm sure some or many of you already do is, is being part of groups who may, living in city, who may, although they live in cities, have gardens, urban gardening projects or be part of a community housing uh, so I'll example. check with this. Who of you has been involved in some urban gardening or community gardening project? <laughs> All quite right. a lot, yeah. And who thinks <laughs> this is not a solution? Red card, please. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, people believe kind of it's a solution. Well, it's not the solution. It's, it's, uh, it shows that other things are possible. And if you think of the big parts uh, in life that use a lot of resources, it's housing, it's mobility, and it's food. And if you at least do one thing in these three areas, you do already a lot uh, or try to maybe reduce your resource input. But if it's not accompanied by frame conditions, meaning institutions, norms, laws, 
uh, supply of products that support your, let's say, uh, alternative lifestyle, that sooner or later you will be fr frustrated and stop doing it. And that's why it's important that the frame conditions change. And here I'm really somehow lost as well, because if I look at, at our politicians in Austria, we have elections, I'm from Austria, one week later than in Germany, it's absolutely the same. We have a small party called the Wandel Partei, Party for Change, but they have no money, so it's only known via social media within our groups. Um, so I would say you can start doing things uh, by, by sharing or joining groups who do things differently in the areas I mentioned. It's important that it makes fun. Only saying no to things and uh, not consuming and being frustrated is not the answer. Uh, and I think there are many alternatives uh, using less resources and having fun. Um, yeah, Ernst Ulrich Weizsäcker in his books gives examples, and there are many others in, in Tim Jackson's uh, Prosperity Without Growth. But if there is not uh, the, ri the right frame conditions, I'm, I'm a bit sorry that um, this change won't go on. And uh, that's why I see responsibility also in, this, uh, in the area of politicians and also in the business sector. And here I would maybe like to ask you, Mr. Winter, how do you see the responsibility of the business sector as an intermediary? You know, we yeah. have this bottom-up uh, movements we see, we have the top-down that is not being seen from the politicians, and these intermediaries, NGOs and business, is also important. And here I'm, I'm asking you if you might uh, know yes, a solution. Yes, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, anyhow, the entrepreneurs have started in the 70s to develop an integrated system of environmental management. And uh, this has become uh, better and better. And uh, then was introduced uh, norm, ISO 14001, uh, ecological norm. And uh, the systems were still developed. And um, I think it's interesting, uh, not all companies followed, of course, but a lot of companies. And I think more and more it gets mainstream in Germany, uh, but even if I'm totally conv convinced that all parts of the company uh, should be uh, not in conflict with ecological uh, uh, items, it is impossible under the actual uh, conditions to lead a company to bring it uh, uh, to a success. Um, and sorry, von Weizsäcker uh, spoke about uh, a more environmentally oriented tax law so that only companies can have success which are environmentally oriented. And uh, I think many of entrepreneurs would like uh, to go on with it, but the general economic framework does not allow this. And very often uh, politicians point with the fingers to uh, entrepreneurs but I think uh, entrepreneurs have shown a much more or originality. Uh, there is an integrated system of environmental management of companies, but there is not, has not been found, uh, uh, or not, not been introduced, an integrated system of environmental government. Uh, such a system could, for example, uh, include uh, a veto for the environmental minister for uh, ecological, very severe and relevant uh, decisions. But your question was, what is the responsibility of entrepreneurs? Uh, on the highest level, uh, the entrepreneurs must not only be, uh, lead their companies, but must only take responsibility in the public, speak with their workers about the general political conditions and influence their political decisions. And yes, so uh, the responsibility of entrepreneurs uh, became bigger. Yeah. Thank you yeah. very much. So I want to ask, like, as the topic is degrowth, what future can there actually be for a business in a degrowth society? Is it possible? I think for uh, enterprises who are very big and who work on the stock market, it's not a very good concept because they must grow. They have their shareholders who expect profits. But for small and medium enterprises, which are located in a regional context, I think they can pretty easily work without uh, this big goal of growing all the time. Um, also for cooperatives, which do not have the main objective to make profits, I think it's a fairly possible project. 
also for economy uh, for uh, companies who might have the ideal of uh, I don't know how to say in English Gemeinwohl economy um, who uh, yeah, economy of the commons the economy the commons. of for the commons or whatever who for the common good yeah. they can work without uh, with a gr in a non-growing uh, economy, if they have the possibility, for example, if they're not totally dependent on f being financed from banks or whatever, 100%, this is a crucial topic, of course, maybe it's an extra discussion about the money system, of course, but yeah. uh, still I would say, I would ask the other way around, is there any way in going on like this, can we go on like this and ever grow and have companies that must grow and grow all the time. I think not. So we have to choose another way and think about it. And it's not me, one person, giving any solutions. It's the whole society. <laughs> yeah, I have one question coming up. It's like we're saying, like, mm, how is it going to work? It's not working. So like a question I ask myself frequently is like, what on earth has to happen that change will really start? Like, what is it? Mm -hmm. Do we? Do we need a major catastrophe? And it's like, as you've been with the Club of Rome for a long time, so your job has been like for decades to warn society that this is not the pathway to go. So when you're serious about what you're talking, I know it's also coming out of a long experience of being, yeah, the person saying like, hello people, wrong way, go this way, go this way. So what is your feeling? What has to be on the road of mankind that they will actually change the way? I see two alternatives. One, the big catastrophe of the kind of the disintegration in very few years of the Greenland ice, letting the seawater table rise by seven meters or so. Same with the West Antarctic ice plate. That would make Christoph Grant a very popular prophet, or um, Tim Jackson for that matter. <laughs> oh um, but I suppose even you would prefer to do without that catastrophe, even if you would become very popular. Mm. So let's look at the second alternative which is essentially a traje trajectory of people becoming happier under certain measurement criteria, richer, while energy consumption, water consumption, minerals consumption goes down and no longer up. And for that, in the book Factor 5, we have made a design for a long-term kind of tax reform by which we say, oh, which is meant to produce a situation where energy prices, and for that matter water prices, go up each year for 50 years or for 100, by the amount, by the percentage of efficiency increases of the preceding year. So what you pay for your familiar energy services will not be more expensive next year. But next year you would, the society, would need a lot less energy. Mm -hmm. And it's a self-accelerating mm -hmm. process. And has the advantage of several jobs uh, which today are done by excessive use of energy, mm -hmm. now being done by people again. So it is also a strategy of reducing unemployment. Mm -hmm. And EU Environment Commissioner Janis Potocnik clearly says 
We have to shift priorities mm. of technological development from exclusively increasing labor productivity to increasing resource productivity. And that, I believe, is a very benign kind of trajectory we can do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Yeah. Winter. Yes, I think this is a really important uh, point that uh, uh, bigger efficiency uh, is a more important uh, goal than the creation of just more and more energy. I will give you an example, some, uh, some numbers. Um, it is planned that in Germany there will be 60,000 windmills. And um, from, um, from the net of uh, 2,800 kilometers have been built until now 268. And uh, there, will, there will be uh, great problems um, because of destroying uh, the landscape uh, by, uh, you know, by, by these windmills and also um, by the electricity um, the transports. And, uh, it is extremely important uh, to find ways to increase efficiency. And uh, we have about uh, four million enterprises in Germany, including very small with three or four people, 40,000 households, uh, no, 40 million households, and uh, 400 uh, communities. And all they, uh, all these communities, have uh, the possibility uh, of investing into uh, methods of decreasing energy, of um, uh, more efficiency of uh, energy. We uh, use per year now in Germany uh, about uh, one billion uh, uh, energy at one billion euro. Excuse me, you have 30 yeah, seconds. Yeah, 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 Thank one, you. Uh, one billion. Uh, Euro, and we could reduce this in the next uh, year by year uh, by about 30% with uh, investments and with a return on investment between three and eight years. And we have the capital for investment because in Germany uh, we have investment capital of 5,000 billion euro. I just uh, underline what uh, Ernst Ulrich Weizsäcker said. First priority is efficiency of energy. Second priority is increasing amount of energy. But wouldn't like you say that when everything gets more and more efficient, people are just going to consume much more? Let me first say one other thing to the to this idea of how, how can I will answer this in a second and okay. how we how we can come to change. I, I'm I'm not very optimistic. I'm not. I don't like these catastrophe scenarios. I'm Thank you. It's it's very much uh, demotivating me a lot. And uh, no. who thinks <laughs> catastrophe scenarios are demotivating? <laughs> <laughs> Hands up. Okay. Who feels motivated by a catastrophe scenario? Red card up. But it's a bit hellish color. <laughs> so <laughs> so who, who feels neutral, just to check you're still awake, who feels neutral about catastrophe scenarios? Should be all the rest. Oh, everybody green card up. <laughs> everybody green card up. <laughs> so show you're still awake, you have your card. <laughs> mm, okay, 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 okay. Thank you. Good. So, so you can continue. I was just talking about the ecological catastrophe scenarios. I think we have other catastrophe scenarios coming up. It's economic catastrophes and social catastrophes because all our society is dependent on growth and we don't have growth anymore. So what will happen? We have, um, as you said, this public finance systems are going bankrupt within the next couple of years or 10 years, 15 years, I don't know. Our state is not possible to finance the system just by himself without growth being generated. All the economists from hundreds of years ago, Adam Smith, Ricardo, Mill, Keynes, Marx, all of them saw 
capitalism come to a point where we don't have growth anymore. And we have reached this point. And as Peter Victor puts it, he's talking about slower by design, not disaster. We're slowing down anyway. And within the next 10, 15, 20 years, I, will, I think in, in the public, also in politics, there will be discussion about it. Of course, growth can create jobs, but you need a growth of 2 or 3%. But we don't have 2 or 3% anymore. We have close to zero. And we've been having it for, let's say, five years or two years. Yeah? In the long run, we go to the zero. So think about it in 15 years or in 20 years. And uh, therefore, we need to be prepared. We need to educate ourselves and the society to develop concepts in dealing with a degrowth or aftergrowth society. And yeah. yeah. All right. But let me then ask, uh, answer your question. OK. Um, That's the last one we'll the, do here, because then yeah. we want to open up to the questions from the general public. Uh -huh. The empirical evidence of the so-called rebound effect oh. that oh, all so the efficiency gains are being gobbled up by additional consumption stem from a time of continuously decreasing commodity prices. So don't be surprised. And the kind of strategy that I'm proposing is exactly the answer to the rebound effect. It means that it becomes more reasonable not to waste energy. Today, it is reasonable to do it because energy got cheaper over 200 years. I mean, in our minds, it's only the last 12 years where it got a little more expensive. But um, the reality over 200 years has been cheap energy. And I would be happy if the German situation was worldwide. The main thing happening in the world economy is zero-cost shale gas in North America. This is what is impressing Wall Street and all the others. And India and Poland and Indonesia and Canada and Brazil, they are all dreaming of shale gas, no end. But you're talking about a steady-state economy, aren't you? You're talking well, about that's a different story, yeah. and there Stay I agree with you. It's very sad. Now the discussion starts to get yeah. going hot on Fine. stage. <laughs> I have to ask you. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> so now okay. I ask the ambassadors of the audience to come up to the front. I hope you had a good selection time. We have some interesting questions. So do you want to start? Um, yes, indeed. I do. There you go. We have some great questions here. And uh, the one we want to start with is, who are the actors of change? In a total, where does change start? Who are the, I didn't the actors get. of change? Okay. Who feels like he wants to answer these questions? Okay. I can say maybe something. I don't have the answer, but I have some ideas. <laughs> uh, everybody, I would say, who feels that he or she wants to change something. Uh, and of course, some might be more important than others. But I think we do need role models, but not in the form of VIPs and very famous and known persons, but just persons like you and me who do things differently and who kind of have an, a charisma or a, an aura of feeling well. I think this has to be connected. What was said in the beginning, I think Christoph Bayou, of um, decoupling growth, economic growth and well-being, I think it's, it's important and it's possible and people who, who are able to do this should be role models of the future and should show this. Um, these are actors of change. I also see business people as actors of change. Who, there are companies, at least I know a couple of them in Austria, I'm not so familiar in Germany, who really do things differently. Be it, maybe you know it, uh, Gea, Waldviertler Schuhe, Heine Staudinger or Sonnentor, this tea you get where, where the, really the bosses of the companies say they would not earn more than maximum three times what the person who earns least in the company earns and they really do it and these are role models um, and we would need politicians here I don't know whom whom uh, and who sh shall start I try to say it before uh, it doesn't matter all, every <laughs> in all levels it has to start on the bottom and in the intermediaries and on the top uh, we can't wait for the others to start. And I see starts from the bottom rather than from the top, and I would like to see it more, but that's what I would answer. 
Okay, you want to add something? Yes. yes Go yes. ahead. I think uh, today you have to concentrate on the small actors, not just see the big business, but small companies, small local communities. And uh, for example, when you go to small companies, it's not sufficient to just make a law. They will not read the law. But you have to give good examples, and they will follow a good example. So you have to start uh, with the small. i just give you an example. Um, there was a power station in uh, Krakow, and uh, they installed a desulfurization uh, system, which was very expensive. And uh, they would have had double the success with the same money if they would inv have invested this in all uh, the, the burners of the small houses around, in the technology of all these houses. But they did not think of the small. But uh, there was an initiative already uh, uh, some years ago which was started, small, sustainable management for all local leaders. We have to think of the small. Thank you. I think we also want to hear some more questions. So, Alessa, do you want to give us another one? Yes, of course. Can you hear me now, like this? Okay. Um, a lot of questions were concerned with the topic of developing countries. And here's a question. How can you justify no development and no growth in developing countries where development is still closely linked to access to housing, food security, and clean water? And then there's the sentence, and I think it's provoking, so I will read it out. Green growth is only suitable as a first world idealist concept. Post growth is not reality in the developing world. All right. Absolutely right. I mean, I live in Germany, and I can only think about concepts for Germany. And I'm very much thinking about my friends in other countries who are not on this economic level like we are in Germany, and this is exactly why I think we should degrow, that other countries can grow. I'm not at all talking about degrowing for any country who is on a, on a, on a level where growth and uh, development is linked together, but I still think that it can be inspiring also for other countries who are not highly industrialized to think about ways to develop without having a, just a rising GDP. It must not be connected. But I'm not at all saying that as long as it is connected that these countries shouldn't grow. I'm not stupid. I mean, I'm not <laughs> that's not a debate. It's a Western Europe debate. Uh. Does everybody agree on the podium? No. Why I not? I fully understand the emotions behind the question. But I would very clearly distinguish between degrowth, which is not acceptable to any developing countries, from green growth, which would be an extremely good option for, let me say, 90% of the developing countries. <laughs> I hear some clapping. <laughs> You can also raise your cards in agreement while we could extend <laughs> their views. <laughs> okay, so anybody else wants to add up on this topic? Otherwise, I would ask you, Svenja, to read another one. Okay, this is a very interesting one. Um, how can we imagine a post-growth society that does not interfere with individual liberties, such as, for instance, pr uh, the right to private prosperity? Or the right to have children. Indeed. <laughs> Hmm. Christoph, you want to answer again? I have to. I mean, I want to ask the other way around. How can you imagine a growth society without interfering the right of other people to live a decent life in other countries who work for us, who produce our consumer goods? That's just the other question. Sorry. <laughs> Very good. I see signs of agreement. That's good. Yeah. All right. The Anybody right to else? consume. Yeah. I mean, the right to consume. Sorry. Is that what humanity is heading for, to have a right to consume whatever I want, whatever, who produced it and under what conditions it is produced? I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> um, maybe I try to say something to this. It's not so easy, but I think it's, um, it's about values and what I value. Because the question was about private property 
And it might be that in this ideal post growth, or call it sustainable society, private property or income might not play this big role anymore. As long as I connect my own well being with having a lot of property and stocks and income and so on, then I might feel, of course, um, uh, under pressure or I, f I feel limited in my freedom. But as soon as I start not seeing well being connected to this, all this material stuff, I might feel even more free in maybe having less. And this again is only true for people who already have a lot. And I would also opt strongly for differentiating between countries within group between groups within countries because even in the rich countries you have a, a gap between poor and rich and between different sectors economic sectors so, so if i must just to make it more concrete what do you think is like appropriate question. like for for example living in europe what do you think appropriate in which can you define it yeah it's like <laughs> more like where is it where would somebody say like i don't need this i could just reduce to that what would you think is kind of the future where we're going to well, it's not me or who am I to say how much uh, someone has to have. This is a hard question and has to be discussed among maybe politicians or other experts. I don't, I don't know. But I would, I would maybe start asking people in schools or wherever, hey, what, what it is that makes you happy? If you think, maybe you do it now for a second, when did you feel really happy the last time and why? And if you do this, very often, I, again, for people who have already, you know, the limits of uh, f to, to fulfill basic needs, or you have, have enough to fulfill basic needs, the answer for many is, I felt happy because I was connected to people. Very often it is with this, and this is not material, this is immaterial. There, there are immaterial strategies to meet needs a lot. Of course, not the, the need for food or shelter or, or um, um, clothes, but for, for being loved, for participate, by, uh, having my own identity, having, being creative and so on, I don't need a lot of resources. And to help people seeing this, this might be a, a task for us, for all of us here. And there are alternatives and of course everybody has to have the freedom uh, to choose among alternatives. Not only give them one where you don't, we are not allowed to, to, to use resources, give them a couple and then people are able to choose and this is what we need. That's what I think. Thank you very much. Okay, I still want to give some more questions a chance to pop up. Yes, in order that I can um, check my questions, how much time do we have? Like for four questions well, or for two? I can't say, it depends on the length of the answer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, then I will put that one in the front. Okay, a lot of questions were also concerned with people who are not convinced about post-growth concepts and how can people and politicians be convinced. And I think also a nice way to put it was also how are you reacting to people who listen to your concepts of post-growth or degrowth and think that a certain society would not work? I somehow got confused on the way. Should I repeat it or do Yeah, it one more time, please. Just the crucial part of it. Okay. How do you react to people who are not convinced from your concept? Well, which concept? The concept of post growth, degrowth, green growth. All concepts. <laughs> well, that's a pretty broad question. So your concept. Whatever yeah, your is concept, your concept. Your <laughs> Yeah, the one you're standing here for, I would it's say. It's to Christoph, exactly, the question. No, so. it's to all of the... It's to all. Mm -hmm. I would have a hard time to answer this. You can I mean, with post-growth, it's really uh, an interesting way of talking to people, and there are usually two directions the discussion goes. One is, like, no, 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 what are you talking about? I don't want to talk with you anymore. And then it's hard to find a way of discussing with each other but it's like with any other topic <laughs> in the world, I think. So, but the other one is that we can get in touch to each other and talk and change I our just, ideas. I just want to see like, who of you can actually imagine a world of post-growth? It seems about half. And I also want to see who is strongly opposed, like would say like, no, that's not the pathway. So that's also, well, not so many. So actually it's there's a lot of people who are convinced that might be a solution. And with politicians and anybody else who is taking decisions, it's about education. It's about developing good concepts and presenting them in a suitable way. And yeah, it, 
I think the idea will find its way. I'm very optimistic. All right. So I think when I look at the time, <coughs> it's depending on the answer, we can have like one or two more questions. Svenja, there you go. Wonderful. This one is quite interesting. What is Speak a bit more in the microphone. Course, I'm sorry. What is the simplest move or action? Even more. <laughs> what is the simplest yeah. move or action, something that even a child could do, to begin a sustainable lifestyle? Huh, I think, wow, interesting one. I think everyone on the podium can just answer one thing, okay? Mr. Winter, what's the easiest thing also a child can do? Yes. Uh, we have to create uh, love for animals, for all uh, life. And uh, when the child is cautious with animals, with living beings, and uh, does not uh, shoot everything uh, down uh, with the uh, with the PlayStation, then <laughs> it's the right uh, it's it's the right attitude, uh, which will guide the child uh, through all the life. All right, maybe we just want to hear one more question because we have a last fast round of questions. So can I say one sentence? To one the child? sentence to the child. Okay. Child are sustainable already. Children because they are slow, they take their time and they appreciate small things and it's us who cannot slow down. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so one more question from you. Um, do you want to huh. You've got the good one. Yeah, no, because I think mine are now very detailed and I think actually that's a really cool question to end it up because it's about us to act. So mm -hmm. okay. uh, one question would fit in there, otherwise I will not open another... Yeah, I think we have time for one more question. You know what she's meaning? I have no idea. <laughs> you <laughs> have I'm no sure idea. she's going to help me out here. <laughs> yeah, or maybe you want to say something about the first steps, the other two on well, the panel? That would be my uh, suggestion for rounding okay. it up. No, I still if have I some questions on, on uh, charge oh, okay, for finding. No, you don't have to do that. It's okay. <laughs> So then I would put like, if you don't have like some serious, serious, serious questions on hand that you want to put up first now, I would have one last question for everybody on the podium. And for Mrs. Oman, it would be, you talked about role models. Uh -huh. What is the role model you want to put forward to the people here in the room that you think like, that's a good one? Me? Yeah. Yeah, well, I asked this myself already, but I think... I knew it. <laughs> uh, I, if I can say something for one minute, am I allowed? Uh, Actually, it no, should be short. 30 seconds, okay. Just a couple a of name. years ago, I was... I want a name. Ah, so I'm not me, but I want to be... Ah, no, what, you want a, a role name. Model, a role model for the others, like you said, a role model. What could that be? Yeah, but I said this need not be famous persons and okay. others wouldn't maybe know. Okay, so you I know a farmer, a, a farmer's woman from the very small village I'm from in the south of Austria in Kärnten, who is not very educated on a high level, you would say, but she is, for me, one of the persons I know who really lives sustainably and love to live, loves to live and shows it. And I feel very well when I'm beside her and very uh, modest and um, humble to see how she's doing it without all this knowledge. Okay, hmm. thank you. So, Ernst Ulrich von Weizsäcker, you said like, it's important to be, feel happy and richer. And I was ask you because you're also so much focusing on where the world is going in, in a way of the possible negative aspects, maybe also this evening you put forward. So I want to ask you personally, what was it in the last <coughs> time that made you feel happy and richer? Seeing grandchildren happy. Thank you very much. <laughs> Christoph, you're right of doing your PhD now, and there's quite some people who's doing his PhD now here. Hands up, cards <laughs> up, some here. So you're deep down in it. So what is the greatest challenge that you encounter, and what's your solution? Yeah, the greatest challenge is to make a combination of my life and my different jobs and with my PhD. Because the PhD wants time and I don't have the time I want to give it all the time. And the solution is, I really just found out in the last weeks uh, when I was uh, in holidays, that 
it's daily life where the change takes place. If I slow down in daily life and I don't take the bicycle but walk to the office and take my time and don't stress myself too much, then I have the power and the energy to, to do my PhD. Wow, yeah. very practical. <laughs> <laughs> and now, Dr. Georg Winter, you're, <laughs> like I also presented already, you're famous not only as a poet but also as a fast speaker. And you, I think maybe you have something in mind to give us an idea what that actually is about. And I would really like to hear you. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, I propose uh, th that I make uh, uh, 20 seconds in speaking and perhaps uh, surrounding uh, something at the piano which shows a little fight <laughs> between mankind <laughs> and nature. It starts with nature, then mankind is, mankind is very aggressive. And uh, <laughs> at the end, there is harmony between both. It will be very short. It's such a coincidence, <laughs> there's a piano. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, I, saw, I saw it, yes. Who is interested in this? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think yeah, it might yeah. be a cheering up. It's actually very hot in here. Who is yes. agreeing on that? <laughs> oh, yeah. my God, I have really hard time. So <laughs> yes. can you open the doors a bit for this last celebrative yeah. moment? Oh, yes. please. <laughs> I, I will speak uh, very quickly now, but in, in German, yeah. Wenn beim Bangkoker Ping Pong die Bangkoker auf ihre Bangkoker mal gucken, wie die Pekinger Ping Pong Profis die Bangkoker von der Platte packen, dann kochen die Bangkoker. Wenn beim Bangkoker Ping Pong Pokal die Bangkoker auf ihrer Bank hocken und bange gucken, wie die Pekinger Ping Pong Profis die Bangkoker von der Platte pauken, dann kochen die Bangkoker. Nicht? Da muss man so die Tischtennisbälle fliegen sie. Wenn beim Bangkoker Ping Pong Pokal die Bangkoker auf ihrer Bank hocken, bange gucken, wie die Pekinger Ping Pong Profis die Bangkoker von der Platte pauken, dann kochen die Bangkoker. Oh mein Gott! <laughs> it was, it was jetzt, about ping pong. <laughs> noch ein ganz ökologisches Verhalten. Jemand, der mit der Moto Guzzi spazieren fährt durch ganz Italien. Gas Moto Guzzi, das war Palermo. Gas Moto Guzzi, auf nach Salerno. Cento Comandante, das war Cosenza. Cento Cinquanta, das war Potenza. Gas Moto Guzzi, durch die Abrusse. Timo di Roma, aus der Verputzung. Cento Sessanta, das war Piscara. Cento Sedano, Asch und Carrara. Gas Moto Guzzi, Vollgas auf Pizza und auf der Piazza. Chianti und Pizza. Ganz klar. Dankeschön. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Die dritte Bunde. One minute, one minute nature, then mankind aggressive, and then harmony. It's improvised. I'd okay. I have the yellow card in hand if it's going to be an yeah. opera. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> I think it's the most beautiful closing I ever had to a political body of discussion. <laughs> it's I want to <laughs> use this moment to thank you all of you for coming here, for spending your time with us, sharing your thoughts and inspiration. Thank you very much for being here today. A big hand of applause to our podium. Thank you very much. 
Now, I also have some thanks to say to the cooperation partners. And I've, it's, I'm trying to make it short. It's kind of a long list I was given. So one is first the Center for Development Research of the University of Bonn. The city of Bonn and, of course, the Youth Future Project Association who've made this possible. And they also, the organizers want to thank to the Federal German Foundation for the Environment, who's like giving out the prize, the Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, the Foundation for International Dialogue of the Savings Bank in Bonn, the German Academic Exchange Service, the AAD, the Software AG Foundation, Robert Bosch Foundation, and, not last but not least, European Union Youth in Action Programme. Without the final financial, without their final support, no, the financial support, this conference will not, not have been possible. My greatest thanks to you for being here, being a very attentive audience, for taking part, for putting up some great questions. I hope very much you take some inspiration with your home. And yeah, from my part, thank you very much for being here and a nice evening to you. Thank you.